do it. All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are really excited today for a number of reasons. Number one, February is our entire month dedicated to amazing women in STEM. So we're really thrilled to have Riley Moore join us today, and I'll introduce her in a little bit. Um, but also, this is a joint presentation with Reach the World. So Reach the World is another fantastic digital education organization that does long-form stories. They help to chart fantastic expeditions and share the details of those with classrooms all around the world every single day. And so we've done a bevy of partnerships with them over the last few months. We're excited to continue that, especially with regards to Mosaic. So thank you so much to our classes for joining today. We really appreciate you being here for this special presentation. So right now we're joined by four classes from across North America. I'm gonna give them a chance to say hi, and then we'll dive back in with our presentation. So we've got Mr. Kim's grade nine through 11s in Owen Sound, Ontario. Hi guys. Hello. Welcome. Hi, <laughs> we've got Miss Latore's grade fives in Hasbrook Heights, New Jersey. Hi guys. Oh, let's get your mic, wants to work. There we go, you're there. It's not letting me demute you, but that's half the fun. There has to be some tech difficulty, otherwise it'd be boring. Um, so yes, our New Jersey class. We've got Miss Marisha's grade fours in San Antonio in Texas. Hi guys. Wave. Hi. Hey, we love having Texas class again. You guys are like the most enthusiastic ever. Um, and last but not least for now, expecting maybe a couple more. We've got Miss Braddy's class, grade sixes in Festus, Missouri. They're just pouring in, they start on the hour. So we'll come back to them during Q and A. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speakers. So we are joined live in Boulder, Colorado and Salt Lake City, Utah, respectively, by Dave Costa and Riley Moore. So they are a research associate and engineer that were on board. Oh, oh, we got another class. There we, go. we got all the classes, <laughs> all at once at the very end. They were on board the Mosaic Expeditions. This is the largest Arctic expedition in history where the icebreaker Polar Stern will be trapped in the ice for many, many months, welcoming in researchers from all over the world to study and learn about the Arctic, learn about climate change, learn about this remarkable place on our globe. And so having undertaken leg one of that expedition, Riley and Dave are here today to talk a little bit about the work they did, about the life on the ship, and a little bit more. So we're so excited to have them. And without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Dave and Riley, and take it away. Hey, everybody. Um, we're going to start off with uh, Riley, and she's going to tell us what it's like to get up there and life on board the uh, Russian ship. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Riley Moore and I'm in my third year of a mathematics PhD program at the University of Utah. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of the Mosaic School, which took part during the first leg of the expedition. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit today about a Russian research vessel called Academic Fedorov that I was on for just about six weeks. Um, and I was on this vessel um, as part, again, of the Mosaic School. And you can see here in the background, this is the ship and me. Uh, we started our expedition out of Tromsø, Norway. And um, there are about 20 participants in the program and we spent about six weeks um, from the end of September till the end of October of this past year. So I just wanna give you an idea of what it was like to be on the ship. So I have some pictures here of you can see the bathroom, which are inside of our cabins, the hallways to our cabins, and then the bunks. Uh, there are three to four people in each room uh, as part of the mosaic school. Um, as you can see here, I have all, all important snacks at the bottom. So I definitely recommend if you ever go on a ship for research, take chocolate and your favorite snacks. It was definitely a lifesaver. Um, moving on here, just some more rooms on the ship. We had the general lounge area where the scientists would hang out and we'd all talk about research and what's going on on the ship. We also had the school room where we were lucky enough to receive lectures from world-class scientists and researchers that were on board both the Academic Fedorov and some that were flown over by helicopter uh, from the Polar Stern to teach us for a few hours. And finally, you can see the gym where we had fun playing ping pong uh, doing sit-ups and push-ups, among other activities. Uh, moving on, we had the mess hall. This is kind of the biggest room on the ship that we had access to. We'd have journal meetings here. We would eat all of our meals. Um, there's also this uh, computer monitor you can see at the top. Uh, the pink area is actually the ice extent. 
So we could see um, where the ice was at. We could also see our location. And in fact, in this picture, our ship is actually off the screen. So we're so far north that you can't see the little icon of our ship. Um, and then finally, there's this damage book, which is really neat. I think it um, is a way of communication whenever you don't have a lot of technology, because instead of sending like an email that you have a problem in your room, you would write it in this book, like, hey, my AC is broken. Can you please come fix it? Something along those lines. So that was good to have. The crew was always very on top of fixing problems when they arose. Uh, just to give you an idea, a lot of people ask me what the food was like. So it was really pretty normal food, luckily. I thought it was really good food. I was a little nervous at first, but uh, we had normal oatmeal, eggs, bacon, stuff like that for breakfast. For lunch, pasta, different soups, meat. And for tea time, which was my favorite meal of the day, we had like pastries, pancakes, scones. We even had pizza one time. And finally for dinner, um, similar, sometimes we'd have fish. Uh, we had some squid once or twice. And finally there was some happy pasta here at the bottom in the middle. I don't know if you can see the little smiley face or not, but uh, always good food um, to eat. So that was a really good experience for sure. And finally, um, we were lucky enough to have a lot of birthdays while we were on the ship. And so the crew would make us birthday cakes for uh, celebrating these sorts of occasions. And I thought they were really cool. Um, and so I wanted to share those with you. Next, um, this is Grigory. He was the first mate of the ship and he was uh, kind enough to give us all tours of the bridge. So the bridge is where the ship um, navigation happens. So there's lots of different equipment to help navigate through the sea ice and the oceans. And um, the wheel of the ship is there. You can see me driving it for just a second. Um, and so he's really cool just showing us all of the old equipment as well as the new modern equipment that they have on the icebreaker. Um, another place on the ship that was really neat to see was the hold. And the hold was this location uh, below deck where a lot of the equipment was being stored. And you can see these big containers uh, with all the scientific equipment that we were taking to deploy. And in order to get down to the hold, you had to go down this really quite long ladder. Um, you had to wear climbing vests and have climbing hooks so that you were always attached to the ladder at all times in case you slipped. And finally in the bottom uh, corner here, you can see this basket. And this was called a mummy chair. And this is used to move people from the ice to the ship or between ships. So lots of neat uh, instruments and tools down in the hold to use. Um, another important means of transportation was the helicopter operations. So you can see uh, the helicopter deck in these pictures. The picture with the group of people is our, our initial group photo on the Federog ship whenever we were just leaving out of Norway. And uh, we had a safety drill where we all put on our life jackets and went up really tight stairs to get out to the helicopter pad where if there was an emergency, we could get in the life craft nearby. Uh, luckily, nothing like that happened for real. So that was great. But uh, we did get to see a lot of neat helicopter operations happening. Um, there were both helicopters on the polar stern, which was going out to sea with us, as well as on our ship, the Federov. So in order to transport people between the two ships, we would use helicopters. Um, finally, I just want to talk about a few neat things that we got to see. So um, the first is bioluminescence. So bioluminescence is um, light emissions from different kinds of organisms. Um, particularly, we think these are dinoflagellates, as you can see over on the right. Um, however, uh, we weren't sure exactly what kind of organism they were, but most scientists thought that they might be dinoflagellates. And bioluminescence is neat because it's the emittance of light. And what it really looked like was really flickering stars in the night sky. This photo here is people along the bottom and we're looking into the water on a, a, an exposure photo that was taken over many seconds. So the real bioluminescence was almost like flickering lights. It was neat to see. Um, additionally, we got to work, do some work in the lab. And so you can see in this picture on the far left, there's a scientist who's holding what looks like a long ski pole. And this ski 
a sort of instrument is used to measure the snow and ice thickness. Um, you can also see in the next photo a ice core. And this ice core we were cutting into pieces about 10 centimeters long and allowing it to melt so that we could measure the amount of salt that is in the ice core. And so you can see me holding the, uh, a sample in the bag. And then finally, this yellow instrument is used to measure different kinds of particles that are in the air. Um, and so these will suck in different air samples and measure what sorts of, um, for example, uh, aerosols, different kinds of chemicals, what pollution, different things that may be in the air. So all of these instruments among many others were used as part of the expedition. Um, finally, we have Northern Lights that we saw, and these were really amazing. Um, we saw these towards the beginning and then at the very end of our expedition, because whenever we got too far north, they were actually difficult to see. So we were too far north to see the Northern Lights at certain points. Um, and so these were extremely beautiful pictures for sure. Um, definitely great to see if you ever get the chance. Um, and finally here we have an ice watch program. And so there's this little radio room on the ship. And what people would do is we would go out on the deck of the ship and spend uh, 10 to 20 minutes looking at the ice and trying to understand what kinds of ice are going by. So are they thick, thin? Are they in large chunks or small chunks? Um, you know, does it look like the ice is brand new, just starting to form, or is it older ice? And this was important for part of characterizing the ice conditions in the Arctic. So we worked on that. Um, on the right here, you can see a plot. And this plot actually shows at one point our ship uh, was having a hard time getting through one of the chunks of ice. So we started having to back up and go forward, back up and go forward. So you can see this zigzag pattern in the plot. And the movement from up to down is actually the ice flowing as a whole together with the ship. So as we were trying to go back and forth from left to right to get through the ice, we were also drifting upwards. So I thought this is an interesting plot to show um, the, how the ship was really transport, transporting us through the Arctic. Um, luckily, most of the time, this is the worst it was, ever was. Most of the time, we were able to break through the ice relatively easily. But in this case, it did take us a while to break through with the ice flow. So the ice that I'm talking about, here's some photos of it. Um, you can see some ice flows in the top left picture. And it was amazing to me to see the different kinds of geometry of the ice. I wasn't expecting all of the variation. I'd, I'd been studying ice for about two years now, um, specifically um, trying to understand different dynamics and how it evolved. Uh, but just being able to see it in person was an amazing experience for sure. Um, and to talk a little bit more about the transportation, um, you can see in this photo on the right, there's the academic Fedorov, the red ship on the right, and then the polar stern is the blue and blue ship on the left. You can kind of see mostly, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but over here on the left, and then the right here with the big helicopter pad is the Fedorov. Um, we would come together in order to transport people and equipment back and forth between the two ships. And in the background, really tiny in the picture on the left, you can see that little mummy chair that I talked about briefly from the hold, and it's being used to transport people across. So um, it was really a team effort going out to the Arctic with the Fedorov and the Polar Stern working together to get the whole operation set up. And finally, uh, What's an expedition without polar bears? Well, I was super excited to be able to see polar bears. In fact, the first polar bear I saw was this first photo, the upper left photo. And this is a single male bear, we believe. And we only saw it briefly. Then uh, our ship went past. It was there maybe for about a minute. And I, I thought that was amazing. Like I couldn't believe we got to see polar bears for real. And then though a mom and her cub bear showed up in the expedition. And they actually stuck around for a while. So you can see these pictures that I took of the mom and her cub. And uh, they actually caused a little bit of havoc for people on the polar stern trying to set up instrumentation on the ice flow. Um, luckily, it didn't cause any problems for our ship, though.
So I'll just wrap it up here. My role in the expedition was to set up these, what are called SIMB3. They are seasonal ice mass balance buoys. And um, what you do with these buoys is they're, they're almost like a really long pipe. And you drill a hole into the ice and stick it through so that it goes all the way to the water through the ice. And it has special instrumentation on it that can measure the ice thickness, it can measure temperature, it can measure the snow depth. And so they'll, they'll be there frozen in the ice for an entire year. And they'll, they'll send back data to the scientists so that we can understand how the ice evolves. And um, I was lucky enough to install three of these buoys and it was my first time doing real field research and I'm super excited to see what kind of questions you may have. So thank you very much for your time and I'll turn it on over to Dave. Fantastic, thank you so much, Riley. And yeah, Dave, if you wanna take it away and when we're done, we'll take questions with the both of you from all our classes. All right, great. Thanks, Riley. That was an awesome uh, wrap up and uh, highlighting all that cool, cool stuff that we did on the Russian ship. So I'm an engineer over at the University of Colorado in a group called Ceres, the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences. And I have an uh, office in over at the Federal Lab, the NOAA building, where I am now. And I am in Boulder, Colorado. So I have worked with uh, Mosaic for well, since last year and I went up with Matt Shoup, which I think some of you have talked to last week or he did one of these also. And uh, we're, Matt and I are also gonna go up in the summertime to take everything down. We all installed everything. Now we're gonna take everything down. We ran all the, all the equipment. So today I was asked to talk about what life was like on the polar stir. And so I was up there for three, uh, three months, three and a half months, including travel. It was dark the whole time. It was cold and it was a lot of work, but it was really fun. There was uh, polar bears and Arctic fox and helicopters and all, all those things. So I'm just gonna share some photos that I have, not quite as, uh, smooth as, as Riley's presentation, but I am going to share uh, my screen and just kind of click through some pictures. Hopefully everybody can see all those pictures on there. Sure can. Uh, it, interestingly enough, uh, Riley uh, took a picture of her cabin and I have a picture of my cabin here. And when you're up three months, you have to do your own laundry and my laundry, my drying room was uh, my cabin. So that worked out pretty good. My cabin mate, Matt, he, I don't know if he liked it as much as I did, but <laughs> uh, it worked out, worked out pretty good for me. And uh, when we want to take a break, uh, there is a gym. So we have uh, workout facilities on the Polar Stern. So whenever I had some free time, which wasn't very much, I just, uh, ran down to the gym and uh, tried to lift some weights and I used this bike a lot. Uh, it was super fun. There was a pool over behind this wall. There's a pool uh, that worked out really good. So a lot of people use that. And Dave, sorry to interrupt Dave really quickly, but when you click the pictures, it's clicking, but it's not actually coming through on Zoom. So we still see this bunch of pictures, but not any individual ones. So we can see the gym and the, the thing you're pointing at just not filling the screen for us. Just let you know. Sorry, so Dave. if I... Um, so you're not seeing. No, it just, it looks like it's buffering, but we see the individual small picture amidst all the pictures, but nothing fill on the screen. Sorry to bother. Oh, no. Um, still nothing. No. Your earlier presentation when we were testing before worked. <laughs> uh, let's, let's try this out again. I'm sorry, everybody. No, all good. In worst case, if you just tell us about it, that's all good too. But let's see if we can get these. There we go. That's better. Perfect. All right. So let's try this a different way. Um, it's not going to be in order, but this uh, going to work every morning or going back to the ship, this is what it looks like. So if you look in the background here, this is all dark. We were out, uh, there was dark 24 7. Uh, and we would get to work either by snowmobile, by walking, by skiing, uh, or by helicopter. So this was a typical walk to work. 
And um, it took about 10 minutes to get to the, our site was the uh, Met Hut. Um, and everybody would just kind of band together and, and walk out there. So let's see what's now. I... While you're trying to get the picture, oh, there we go. Got a video. All there. right. Small, so, you can see it. Uh, you can see that? Yeah. Okay, so this is what it's actually like to walk on the ice. Maybe you can hear, hear it. Just a little bit. And there's the ship in the background. Uh, how, how cold is it when you're doing this, by the way? So it can be anywhere from uh, minus 30 to, you know, minus 10. Uh, again, another shot walking to work. Um, when we have uh, all the, the ship provides power to all the sites and sometimes we need to go out and repair uh, the power lines. So this is a picture of Matt and myself repairing some of the power lines after a giant storm. Um, you see that we're all bundled up in our, in our gear. Uh, and it's pretty cold, having aluminum there, and uh, it just takes takes a long time to get everything going. I'm gonna try something here because it's just really hard to. Um, there's no order. <laughs> I find smacking the computer helps nine times out of ten. <laughs> Let's see. Do we see anything there? No. Still got your last picture up with you guys fixing stuff on the ice. Yeah. Uh, Really not working for us. That's okay. Oh boy, I'm I'm sorry. That's okay. So every single day you're going out and doing this walk to these places, or are you going to different work sites over the months that you were there? Yes, we um, mostly went to the Met City to take care of the tower that we had. Let's see. Um, all right. Well, let's go right into what my cabin looked like. Hopefully, everybody can see this video. So this is a, a quick video of the, what the cabins look like. And I told, said that I went down to do laundry. So this is the view of how I would get to the laundry. It was about five decks down. There's my bathroom that I shared with Matt. Um, my room number, hallway going down. This is where we would keep our clothes and Arctic gear. There was a main set of stair stairwell that went straight down all these flights. And the first time you get on the ship, it's really confusing. It, you, you don't know where you are. All the doors look the same. All the stairs look the same. So you showed us the room of the Arctic gear. So when you put that on, is there like a, a ramp that takes you outside of the ship or do you have to walk down all these decks and sort of exit out at, at ice level, so to speak? So great question. Uh, when you have a cabin that's away from the, the door, you have to put all your gear on and then walk outside. But you have to walk out, you have to go quickly or you'll start sweating because all the gear is so warm that it doesn't really last inside. It's too warm to be inside. So it's really important to strategize the way you get out. Um, so it took me about 20 minutes, over 20 minutes to put my gear on and to get outside. And it was about 25 pounds of uh, gear that I had to wear to keep me warm. Some people could get away with less, but I used a lot of gear. And we're still trying to get to the laundry room. It's, uh, <laughs> that's how far away it is. The journey. Uh, who, who knew that the going to the Arctic would be the easy part would be getting to the laundry room. That would be the journey. Finding, finding the laundry room was definitely a challenge. And uh, those were crew, crew equipment. And there it is. There it is. So this is a huge ship you guys are on. It is. It is a giant ship. Yeah. Um, this is a, uh, one of the ways to get to the our sites is with the helicopter. This is sitting in the back of the helicopter. Uh, this is the amount of space that we had. So these were bags that we had, bags and cargo that we took out to our sites to fix all the remote sites. We had three remote sites away from the ship 
And uh, to get there was only by helicopter. Um, I'm curious to see what photo is going to come next. Ah, I think I mentioned that the Arctic has a lot of cool designs. And I was really mesmerized by the uh, different designs and patterns that were in the snow. So this is a, a picture of one of the patterns I thought was interesting. And in the background here is the uh, Met City where we would walk to. Another pattern in the snow was just uh, fascinating, uh, along with the work that we had to do. Uh, I would always try to take a minute to look at the different designs in the snow and the different beautiful things we could see. Um, so taking the helicopter, this is what it looks like when we get to one of the sites, one of our remote sites. Uh, all the gear that I was talking about, I was wearing there. And this is one of the remote sites that we would all work on and it takes different meteorological uh, data. So we have different instruments that you can see here. Um, and then uh, we have some fuel here. We have a little fuel cell inside and they needed to have all of the um, fuel changed. And uh, we had some polar bear came by and did some damage to one of these. So part of my job was to fix all the polar bear damage. And uh, with my colleagues, we came out and we put everything back together to get everything working. So this was pretty far from the ship, about 10 miles from the ship. And uh, this was kind of, you know, day in the life of working in the Arctic. Uh, I'd go out and, and work on these kinds of things. Um, this is also another uh, instrument at the base of the tower. We had some towers out there. And uh, so you put all your gear on, you go out and as an engineer, so design and build these different pieces of instruments that work on the ice and they need maintenance. So things break or instruments break and we have to go out and fix everything. So you can see in the background, this was still early on in the journey and we uh, hadn't hit full darkness. So part of my job as an engineer is to keep all this stuff running. Um, another photo from uh, working out on the ice. This is at that station at different time, uh, different time, a different day. And you can see I got some goggles on here. My colleagues have a face mask. And this was uh, one of the polar bear guards that we had to keep us safe. So we all work as a team and all the instrument is, all the instruments are out on the ice and we're actually living in the area of polar bear where polar bears are, you know, we're a guest in their area. So we have polar bear guards to keep us safe and to keep the polar bears safe. So they would scare them away if they got too close and they uh, would make a flare or uh, uh, make some noise to scare them away because we didn't want to harm the polar bears right. and we don't want to get eaten either. So. Hey. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. If you don't mind, so we're at the 30 minute mark and we've got about okay. 15 classes watching in on YouTube plus the six that are live with us. And so I, I, I know we could talk all day about all these things and you guys have both had really great presentations, uh, but I want to see if we turn it over to Q&A and then we can cover some of those things and find out what the classes are really keen on and I'm sure we'll cover everything else that you guys uh, wanted to share. That's okay. Great idea. Awesome. All right. Well, first of all, huge thank you to Riley and Dave. That was fantastic. Great overview of this fantastic vessel and some of the cool jobs. You know, when you're walking out on the Arctic ice sheet and you see your ship in the distance and you're thinking about polar bears, that's quite the unique job in the world. So really appreciate that sort of feedback. Um, I'm going to go to all our classes live in a minute. I want to note we've got about 15 groups watching on YouTube, which is huge. So if many of you have identified yourselves already. Please let me know where you're joining in from, and I'll try and take as many questions from YouTube classes as I can. So type them in the chat bar, and we'll go from there. But for stirs, let's kick it off with uh, Miss Latori's class. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, you are good. Oh, they have to go. Oh, they disappeared. Okay. <laughs> let's go to Miss Burvis's class. Let's start with Texas. You guys have a question? <laughs> Come on right. up. Okay, go right in front of the, there you go. Uh, okay. Say it. Uh, I have a question for Riley. Yeah. Uh, how, how did she, how did you get in there? Like, how did you get selected? Yeah, how did you get selected? How did I get selected? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there was an application that was sent out to uh, people that are in masters and PhD programs around the whole world. Um, and out of about 250 applicants, they selected 20 um 
graduate students to take part. So they picked people from the United States, from Germany, from Russia, from, um, let's see, from Italy, from all different places around the world. And um, it was a really great experience to be able to meet people that were interested in the same kind of research that I love. And we all came from different backgrounds too. So I come from a more math background where I do modeling to try and understand how the Arctic system works. And other people were physicists or chemists and they were interested in different kinds of biological systems or the atmosphere. Um, and so we were a really disciplinary, interdisciplinary team that was able to really uh, get involved in and help in each other's research. So I really learned a lot from being in the Mosaic School. And uh, I highly recommend if you get the, get the chance someday to you know, continue, go to college. Can, if you're passionate about research, really get involved. You know, don't be afraid to go on to a master's or PhD program. It really gives you a lot of opportunities out there. So right. I, I know that every single one of you is capable of doing it, and that you can do great things. So go out there and do it if that's what you'd like to do. Amazing, Riley. Thank you so, so much. Uh, all right, let's go to Festus, Missouri. Uh, Ms. Bridie's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. I have a question for Dave. Perfect. Yeah. Um, did you ever see polar bears whenever you were walking to the places that you had to work? Yeah. Let's see, I, did I see any polar bears when I was walking? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I did not see any polar bears when I was walking because we had polar bear guards. And uh, those guards would, if they saw a polar bear, they would announce and get on the radio and tell everybody that there was a bear in the area and we would all go back onto the ship. If we were, if we were outside, uh, we would all head back to the ship so we'd be safe. And then the polar bear guards crew would take care of it. But um, I, some of my coworkers were out on the ice when there was a polar bear came into camp and they, everybody came back safely and we were able to scare the bear away. Fantastic. I mean, this is a huge, this is the apex predator on the earth, so it's not something that you want to run into. Uh, it doesn't usually end well for either party. So, uh, great question. I knew polar bears would get brought up. Uh, let's head to Miss Salazar's class. You guys joined us just after you began from Laredo, Texas, grade nine class. So, do you guys have a question? Go for it. Hey. Oh. All right, Ms. Corey. Uh, I just have a question. It's both for Riley and Dave. Um, was the transition onto your regular day life and onto the ship difficult or did you have to adjust a lot? Yeah. So either one of you can take that one first, but great question. Yeah, yeah, what a great question. Um, it definitely was a transition period, I think. I, I mean, I don't have a huge apartment where I'm living, but to go, you know, from having some personal space to almost none took some adjustment. Um, but luckily, I was just surrounded with amazing people and colleagues and, you know, the people really made it, I think, easy for me to um, really make that adjustment. If, if they hadn't been such great people, I think it would have been really difficult, though. So, um, I think some of the biggest things, you know, just not being afraid to talk to other people, learn about what their research is, what they're doing, it really made the time go by really fast, I feel like. And you know, I took a lot of music and TV shows and books, and honestly, I didn't really use any of it, hardly. I mean, maybe we would have a movie night every once in a while, but it, it was always, you know, a group collaboration sort of experience, which was really great. Fantastic. How about you, Dave? So the uh, transition getting up there was, was pretty straightforward. Um, so focused on, on the work that I didn't really, um, did, it was pretty seamless. The, everything was gradual enough. Coming back was actually uh, more interesting. When I got back to my house, um, I had dreams of uh, mosaic of being there. Um, I would wake up in the morning and I would would be confused of what what ship I was on because we took it took about three weeks to get back to Boulder uh, to the land and then another twenty four hours to fly home. And um, it was days of having what they call sea legs, where I would still feel the ship moving. Um, so that was interesting to, to have that. And being in the uh, dark for three months, um, I, I just feel really comfortable in the dark uh, when it's nighttime here. Um, and so when, I, when it's light out, I can see really far and it's kind of interesting, but the dark is really comfortable. 
What great answers, guys. I love that. I love how neither of you and Riley, that your first thought was room space as opposed to ship in the middle of the Arctic. I think most of us <laughs> who are go to this place would be like, wow, this is going to be different. Um, but yeah, great answers, guys. Um, we've got a few questions from groups on YouTube, and I'm going to take a few in a second. I just want to encourage the other classes. We've got a whole bunch of classes, so please do type in some stuff. Uh, again, we'll take as many as we can. But let me go to Mr. Kim's class for now. If you guys have a question in uh, Owen Sound, come on up. So the one class, uh, uh, one sorry, question we have is, if it's dark all the time, we're assuming it's probably uh, winter time for the Northern Hemisphere. How does your body feel when it's dark all the time? Like, do you guys have that seasonal affective disorder and stuff like that? Yeah, good question. Yeah, um, great question. I'll start out if that's okay, Dave, and I'll let you take over. Um, so whenever I was going out on the Fedorov, we had a little bit of sunlight kind of dusk at the beginning of the expedition, and then Towards the middle, it was mostly dark all day. And then at the end, we had no sun for a while. And having no sun, I think, was definitely a new experience for me. And um, I'll tell you, everybody on the ship was um, really happy whenever we finally saw the sunlight again on our way back. Um, but I think Dave can probably speak better since he was in the dark much longer than myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it was super interesting. I just kind of approached it with, with this great uh, curiosity of being in the dark. Everybody had headlamps on and all we could see was just what was in front of us in our light or the lights from the ship. So uh, I didn't, I don't think I felt any effects from the seasonal disorder. And it was just um, really part of the day and I think part of the reason day and night part of the reason was because there was no hope that it would be sunny the next day uh if you were in Seattle or Netherlands or something like that you would like oh maybe it's going to be sunny tomorrow I knew it wasn't going to be sunny and I was I was ready for it and I just thought it was great to look outside from the bridge and see everybody walking around with their headlamps or the uh snowmobiles moving around or people in the distance so I didn't really affect, I didn't feel any effects of that. I know there were some people on the ship that uh, were using some of those sun lamps and um, I, I just thought it was great. All right, uh, question from Ms. Rob's class in Ottawa, the sea turtles, the kindergarten class in, in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, they wanted to ask, London in that class wanted to ask, how many bedrooms are on the ship and how many people to each bedroom? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So on the Federa for the scientists, there were between like 60 or 80 people doing research and then an additional crew members on the ship. Um, I wanna say, well, for the Mosaic School, we had about four to six rooms between 20 people. So there were like three to four per room. Hopefully those numbers line up. Um, but uh, for, for the higher scientists, I believe they shared for two to a room. Do you wanna speak more about that, Dave? Um, sure, the Polar Stern can take uh, like 124 members. So crew and scientists, most of the cabins were, were uh, two people per cabin, but uh, some, of the, some of the cabins were one person and some of the, well, I know one cabin was a four person cabin. So on this, leg that I was on, we had about 100 people, uh, 40 were crew and about 60 were researchers. Yeah, you drew the short straw to get in the four person, Kevin. Um, <laughs> but great answer, guys. All right, uh, Miss Gwynn's class, uh, uh, Cordell in that class in Irma, Alberta, wanted to ask you, Riley, what was your favorite food aboard the ship? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, my favorite food was definitely uh, apple crepes. So they had like this apple caramel mix for tea time and they had bread like pancakes almost and you could put the apple caramel insides into it and it was like a crepe and it was really good to put a little bit of Nutella on top too. That was my absolute favorite. We, luckily we had that quite a few times while we were gone. Fantastic. I can see why you like tea time so much. Yeah, it was the best time. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go back to some of our live classes. So Ms. Mervish's class, if you guys want to kick us off with another question, come on up. How did it feel um, when you were on the ship? Yeah. Dave, do you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, on the ship, we were on the polar stern. We were uh, frozen in the ice. So uh, the ship didn't move that much. It was all uh, basic 
um, the ship was anchored actually to the ice. So in storms and uh, different sea conditions, I maybe had, would feel like the ship tilting a little bit, but uh, there was really no movement uh, during the expedition when we were stuck in the ice. Yeah, great question. All right, uh, I want to pass along Mr. Funk's class, our grade two from Lethbridge, Alberta, wanted to ask how, did they, how long did it take and how did you get up to the boat? From where you start, how do you get there in the middle of the Arctic? What's going on? Um, how do you get to the middle of the Arctic from the yeah, like when you Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it was quite the adventure in itself. Um, I, so I'm from, I'm originally from Boise, Idaho, but I currently live in Salt Lake City, Utah. So I took long flights over to Europe and then to Tromso, Norway. And Tromso is at the very northern tip of Norway. And then we would get on the ship and it would take about a week, week and a half to get out to the Arctic. And we'd have to barrel through the ice that had already started to you know, form at the edges of the Arctic Ocean. And um, yeah, we just kind of worked our way through. If the ice was thick at some points, we'd have to back up and try and barge our way in. Um, that's how I got there. How did you get there, Dave? Um, very similar. I mean, we were on the same ships getting up there. I flew from Boulder, Colorado out to, I think, New Jersey, to Oslo, to Tromso, and then we got on, this, on that same ship and uh, the academic Fedorov and get up to, went up to the polar stern and then uh, took, uh, we took one of those mummy, I took one of those mummy baskets over to the polar stern mm -hmm. and then get home was the same way on a different ship, the Captain Dronitsen. Yes. Through, the, through the ice and uh, back to Norway and flew home. Fantastic. So ships are coming to pick people up on various legs of this expedition and bring them back to Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Uh, let me go to Miss Salazar's class for another live question. Oh my God, oh my God. Um, how many hours would you spend on the snow? On, on the ice. <laughs> That's all good, man. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there's snow and ice for sure. There you go. That's a great question. Um, well, for me, I was out on the snow and ice anywhere between like two hours at a time up to about five hours. So the buoys that I installed took about an hour and a half, two hours, and then we would want to wait for them to freeze into the ice a little bit to make sure that they would maintain uh, the straightness um, of the buoy that we wanted. So they maintain, be straight. Um, and I was out there about, three times total for the three buoy deployments. But I do know scientists are out there a lot longer. Um, Dave, do you wanna talk about it? So uh, our typical day was uh, get up breakfast and then head out at nine o'clock and be back uh, on the ship for lunch around 12.30. Uh, and then we'd go back out after lunch, 12.30 to about 5.30 uh, and then after that, it was usually the ship would say, okay, we're done because it's really complicated to be on the ice because we need polar bear guards, we need somebody on the bridge, we need communications with the uh, bridge, whoever is running um, kind of logistics. So nobody can be out on the ice by themselves. So it's a, it's a team effort. Uh, so coordinating that the ship really runs the kind of when we can be on the ice and coordinating with the science. So there's a morning session and then uh, afternoon session. And then when we go out to the remote sites in the helicopter, there's some flexibility there because that's a little bit more of a special case where we could be out for m many hours. All right, uh, you know what? We got time for a few more questions. I'm gonna take two from YouTube and one from Mr. Kim's class. I'll start with the YouTube one. Um, from Ms. Sarago's class, grade four is in New Rochelle, New York. They've asked a bunch and a bunch are technical and I really like them, but I love this last question. Was it fun living on the ship? And would you do it again if given the chance? Dave, you can kick us off if you want. Um, it, it was great. I, uh, it, it was just wonderful. There was, uh, the U.S. contingency was really small. So it, I just enjoyed all the people from every, all these countries all over the world. Uh, there was different languages spoken. It was uh, just really great to learn about other people and other societies and other cultures and just the science they're doing. You know, I know our little group 
and what we do, but it was just super fun and interesting to learn what other people do. And I am going back. I'm going to be heading back for another leg. And I leave in July and we're going to, Matt and I are going to be doing the take, run the last part of the mosaic expedition and then pack everything up and get back to uh, sail with the ship back to Germany. So you bet I'm going to do it again. Awesome. Riley, how about you? Yeah. And I mean, really similar to what Dave said, I just, I made some lifelong friends for sure. And I, I would definitely love to go back one day. I think it's definitely, I mean, a lot of times I always said it's a once in a lifetime experience to get to go to the Arctic, but I'm hoping that I get to go again. So hopefully it's not, I guess. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, I'm gonna to go to Mr. Kim's class and then uh, wrap up with one from Miss Gwynn's in Alberta. So Mr. Kim, if you guys have a question or if you personally have a question, because I know how enthusiastic you are, <laughs> go for it. Okay, not too many questions from them, but I do have one for Riley, sorry. Uh, I, I love putting women in my classes and like kind of gearing them towards the sciences, math, technology. Do you have any words of encouragement for any aspiring f uh, females out there that might wanna go into STEM or any type of career? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I just, I want to just say go for it. If it's what you want to do and you're passionate about something, do not be afraid to go in there. Don't be afraid to make a mistake either. I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made and I learned the most from mistakes and everybody makes mistakes, even if they pretend like they don't make mistakes, they do, believe me. Um, but I just want to say, don't be afraid to get involved early in research either and see if it's what you're passionate about. I, I was lucky enough, um, at the end of my high school experience, I joined a chemistry lab at my local college at Boise State University. And, you know, I got that position just by sending an email to one of the professors and being like, hey, is there anything I can do to help out in your lab? And I didn't know what they were going to say. And it, sometimes you just have to take, a, you know, take a chance and ask somebody for what you want, because unfortunately, I mean, the worst that they can say is no. And unfortunately, that might happen. But I think that most people it would be really excited to be involved and get you involved in their research and teach you about what they're doing, because as scientists, and um, that's what we love to do is share our work with other people, get other people involved. So I just encourage you, don't be afraid to ask, get out there, ask somebody, just send an email, say, hey, can I talk to you about what you're doing? Even, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, I don't really know what this person is doing in their work, but I really want to know. So I'm going to go ask them. And I think that's the most important thing is just don't be afraid to ask. And if you do get a no, unfortunately, because it might happen, it did happen to me a couple of times, just persevere, keep asking people, you will get a yes, I guarantee it. Absolutely. Scientists don't bite with the exception of carnivore biologists. And so I, I really I appreciate that. That's a fantastic message. And thank you, Mr. Kim, for asking that as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, we're going to wrap up with one more from a YouTube class. And that is from uh, Marley in Miss Gwynn's class. Wants to know what wildlife did you see on the expedition? So we know polar bears. Was there anything else you guys saw when you were out there? Right. If you want to kick us off, even you're welcome to. Yeah. Um, so as far as wildlife, I saw polar bears. Some people on our ship saw what I believe was a killer whale. I did not get to see it, unfortunately, but I saw a video. I know, bummer. We tried. We kept, they kept being like, there's a whale out. We'd all run out and then it would be gone. But uh, they're fast, unfortunately, and they can be gone quick. But uh, other than that, I think uh, maybe Dave can talk about it. I heard that the polar cern saw Arctic foxes. Um, I guess there were some Arctic cod, which are like fish that were seen um, in some of the ice. Um, lots of stuff, though, is quick moving, especially as the ship is going through. So you got to be pretty lucky. That's why I was very excited to see polar bears for sure. Amazing. Dave, anything you saw? Yeah, uh, just uh, polar bears uh, was definitely the, the big draw. There was an Arctic fox that showed up after I left. Uh, and then there were some cameras that went below the uh, ice, some remote uh, ROVs, and uh, they were seeing squids and fish and stuff. So yeah. Whole bunch of stuff. Well, guys, I, I appreciate this so much. Uh, Dave and Riley, you guys were fantastic. And so for all our classes, I mean, there's so much more you can learn about Mosaic. So we are gonna, we've already put some of it in the YouTube chat bar for the YouTube classes. I'm gonna pass along to those same classes in an email as well as our live groups. 
Uh, so the Mosaic Expedition website, the Reach the World pages that Dave and Riley made up, like some really fantastic resources to learn more, get engaged with this expedition, and then do join us back again on YouTube. We're going to be highlighting this over the next few months. We really appreciate you being here today. And to the Texas classes for their Texas level of enthusiasm. I love it. I always love when we get groups from, from there. So thank you guys so, so much. All right. Uh, Dave and Riley, what we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute the microphones of our classes who are joining us. Uh, and so, boys and girls, if you guys could get ready to join me in saying a huge thank you to Riley and Dave. You are all now demuted in Ms. Mervish, Mr. Kim, and Ms. Salazar's class. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Dave and Riley, thank you so, so much. That was really fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for hosting. And uh, I just feel really grateful to be part of a, such a great, important expedition. Yeah. Well, we're yeah, fine. thank you. Happy. Thank you so much for everybody's time and for being interested in our expedition. And uh, don't be afraid to go out there and be a part of your own expedition, for sure, whether yeah. it's to the Arctic or doing something else. Oh, there's a whole world out there. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Have a nice rest.